Christian, treasurer of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity. Save our souls with the good one. Amen. So, I will do this. <coughs> Okay, everybody see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right, so who wants to read? So I can start. Okay. 76, right? 76, yeah. The presence of the passion of avarice re reveals itself when a person enjoys receiving but resents having to give. Such a person is not fit to fulfill the office of treasure or a bursar. Very practical piece of advice. Yep. 77. A man endures suffering either for the love of God or for hope of reward or for fear of punishment, or for fear of men, or because of his nature, or for pleasure, or for gain, or out of self-esteem, or from necessity. It is one thing to be delivered from sinful thoughts, and another to be free from passions. Frequently a man is delivered from such thoughts when the things which rouse his passions are not present. But the passions lie hidden in the soul, and are brought to light when the things themselves are present. Hence, one must watch over the intellect in the presence of things and must discern for which of them it manifests a passion. A true friend is one who in times of trial, calmly and imperturbably suffers with his neighbor the ensuing afflictions, privations, and disasters as if they were his own. Do not treat your conscience with contempt, for it always advises you to do what is best. It sets before you the will of God and the angels. It frees you from the secret defilements of the heart. And when you depart this life, it grants you the gift of intimacy with God. If you wish to be a person of understanding and moderation and not be a slave to the passion of conceit, Continually search among creative things for what is hidden from your knowledge. When you, what's page? Sorry. When you find that there are vast numbers of different things that escape your notice, you will wonder at your ignorance and abase your presumption. And when you have come to know yourself, you will understand many great and wonderful things. For to think that one knows prevents one from advancing in knowledge. The person who truly wishes to be healed is he who does not refuse treatment. This treatment consists of the pain and distress brought on by various misfortunes. He who refuses them does not realize what they accomplish in this world or what he will gain from them when he departs this life. Self-esteem and avarice produce each other. Those who are full of self-esteem acquire riches, and those who are rich become full of self-esteem. That is what happens to people living in the world. In the case of a monk, if he has renounced possessions, he becomes still more full of self-esteem. But if he has money, he is ashamed, and he hides it, as something unworthy of one who wears the habit. The mark of monastic self-esteem <clears throat> is to be puffed up about one's virtue and its consequences. The mark of monastic pride is to be conceited about one's own achievements, to ascribe these achievements to oneself and not to God, and to hold others in contempt. The mark of worldly self-esteem and pride is to be puffed up and conceited about one's beauty, wealth, power, moral judgment. The achievements of the worldly man constitute the failings of the monk, 
and the achievements of the monk constitute the failings of the worldly man. For example, the achievements of the worldly man are wealth, fame, power, luxury, comfort, children, and what is consequent upon all these things. But the monk is destroyed if he obtains any of them. His achievements are the total shedding of possessions, the rejection of esteem and power, self-control, hardship, and all that is consequent upon them. If a lover of the world obtains these against his will, he considers it a great calamity and is often in danger even of killing himself. Some people have actually done this. Food was created for nourishment and healing. Those who eat food for purposes other than these two are therefore to be condemned as self-indulgent because they misuse the gifts of God has given us for our use. In all things, misuse is a, is a sin. Humility consists in constant prayer combined with tears and suffering. For this ceaseless calling upon God for help prevents us from foolishly growing confident in our own strength and wisdom and from putting ourselves above others. These are dangerous diseases of the passion of pride. It is one thing to fight against a passion-free thought so that it will not stimulate a passion. It is another to fight against an impassioned thought so that there will be no assent to it. Both of these forms of counterattack prevent the thoughts themselves from persisting. <coughs> Resentment is linked with rancor. When the intellect forms the image of a brother's face with a feeling of resentment, it is clear that it harbors rancor against him. <clears throat> Quote, the way of the rancorous leads to death because whoever harbors rancor is a transgressor. If you harbor rancor against anybody, pray for him and you will prevent the passion from being aroused. For by means of prayer, you will separate your resentment from the thought of the wrong he has done you. When, when you have become loving and compassionate towards him, you will wipe the passion completely from your soul. If somebody regards you with rancor, be pleasant to him, be humble and agreeable in his company, and you will deliver him from his passion. You will find it hard to check the resentment of an envious person. For what he envies in you, he considers his own misfortune. You cannot check his envy except by hiding from him the thing that arouses his passion. If this thing benefits many but fills him with resentment, which side will you take? You have to help the majority, but without as far as possible disregarding him and without being seduced by the cunning of the passion itself for you are defending not the passion, but the sufferer. You must in humility consider him superior to yourself. <clears throat> Always, everywhere, and in every matter, put his interests above yours. As for your own envy, you will not take <laughs> it if you rejoice with the man whom you envy whenever he rejoices and grieve whenever he grieves, thus fulfilling St. Paul's word, <laughs> quote, <laughs> rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Our intellect <clears throat> lies between angel and demon, each of which works for its own ends, the one encouraging virtue and the other vice. The intellect has both the authority and the power to follow or resist whichever it wishes to. The angelic powers urge us towards what is holy. Our natural instincts and our probity of intention assist us. But the passions and sinfulness of intention reinforce the provocations of the demons. When the intellect is pure, sometimes God himself approaches and teaches it. <clears throat> sometimes the angelic powers or the nature of the created things that it contemplates suggest holy things to it. An intellect which has been granted spiritual knowledge must keep its conceptual images free from passion, its contemplation unfaltering, 
and its state of prayer untroubled. But it cannot always guard these from intrusions by the flesh because it is obscured by the ploys of demons. <clears throat> the things that distress us are not always the same as those that make us angry. The things that distress us being far more, more numerous than those which make us angry. For example, the fact that something has been broken or lost or that a certain person has died may only distress us, but other things may both distress us and make us angry if we lack the spirit of divine philosophy. You want to pause for a minute and sure. div divine philosophy, what, what is that? Well, okay, the fathers talk about um, the uh, monastic life, about the, uh, spiritual, uh, the spiritual life as the true philosophy. Um, uh, or the divine philosophy. Um, it's, it's, it's the knowledge and it's the knowledge of God. It's the wisdom that comes from God, not the wisdom of this world, not the knowledge or the um, philosophizing of this world, but rather uh, that living experience of knowledge and communion with God, which comes from the ascetic life. Got it. So, um, <laughs> So if we if we if we're lax in our in our spiritual discipline, um, we're very liable to fall into distress um, because we lack that spirit of divine philosophy. In other words, that um, living experience of communion with God, which informs our whole being, essentially. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else have a question? I was just wondering, so in like, um, in the Western um, scholasticism, obviously, there is a lot of emphasis on intellect, but um, would the Orthodox say, like, sometimes in the West, you hear about, like, the intellect um, and the mind, um, they control the, 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 um, the passions of the stomach, or like, you know, basically the mind rules over the, the stomach or, you know, the I mean, is there, is that anything on orthodox about that or is it just the difference in how it's phrased? It's just, it's just how it's phrased. The word intellect actually um, translates to noose in Greek. Um, and so uh, when Maximus in 97 says, when the intellect gives attention to conceptual images of physical objects, it uh, means when the noose pays attention. Um, uh, now in, in a lot of, uh, later Western uh, thought, the intellect, the idea of noose kind of receded, the intellect, idea of the intellect in the classic sense, and it was replaced by the rational mind. Um, and so, uh, uh, for example, the only way that um, we, would, we would gain control of, of ourselves um, uh, through ascetic uh, practice is by training our rational mind um, and by, uh, by using our mind to, uh, to stop ourselves from, from self-indulgence. Now, <clears throat> when we, um, but in, in this context, in the context of, uh, of the Orthodox tradition, um, the mind is, uh, uh, that they're talking about is not the, uh, the rational, part of the, of the soul, it's the noetic part of the soul. Um, and so uh, uh, the, the point is that the, noe the noose pays attention, uh, uh, is supposed to pay attention to God, but it gets distracted um, uh, when, it, uh, when it, its attention is focused on uh, material things. In other words, conceptual images of material things. Um, and so it loses its form and configuration. In other words, instead of uh, contemplating God, it's, it's contemplating things of this physical world. Um, uh, and, so, and so the goal 
Uh, it says, for by contemplating him who is simple, it becomes simple itself and wholly filled with spiritual radiance. In other words, when the, when the intellect, the, which is the noose, focuses on God, um, it, uh, it becomes simple. It be, uh, it, in other words, it loses its, um, uh, distra all the distractions and focuses simply on the presence of God. It simply becomes pure, totally and completely aware of only God. And thus, uh, it's, it, uh, it becomes simple in and of itself because it's only focused on God um, and thus is filled with spiritual radiance. That's, I mean, that's basically what 97 is saying. Um, but back to like 95, an elect which is granted spiritual knowledge must keep its conceptual images free, free from passion. Um, in other words, a new, uh, uh, the spiritual awareness, the news, which has been granted spiritual knowledge, in other words, um, the experience of communion with God um, must, must keep its conceptual images, in other words, the thought forms, uh, free from passions, free from um, habitual reactions to various stimuli. Um, and it's contemplation unfaltering, in other words, that um, it, uh, it should focus on maintaining a state of contemplation, um, uh, which is the uh, absolute um, uh, connection to the uh, awareness of the presence of God. Um, and, the, and thus the state of prayer which is that living communion with God, uh, which is beyond words and beyond all thoughts and beyond all images, uh, it will remain untroubled. But it cannot always guard from these from lack from intrusions by the flesh. In other words, the flesh has its own has, seems to have a mind of its own and um, uh, sends up thoughts, feelings, uh, and uh, 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 passionate reactions. Um, uh, as it says, because it, it is obscured by the ploys of the demons. In other words, um, the demons play with us by uh, inciting our carnal and fleshly um, uh, actions. So, how's that? Yeah, I think it answers it. And there's like a there's a book that's written by a Dominican called The Intellectual Life. I think it probably talks more about probably more on the rational side than like the news. Oh, uh, right. And that's and and you see that's the thing that um, the Catholics had um, uh, the Latin Latin tradition had the same theology of the news that we have, but they changed it substantially. And so they lost that sense of the mystical um, ascent to God. Um, there were some that maintained it um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the monasteries, but uh, very few. And then it was persecuted in the Catholic Church. <laughs> So, now 98 is interesting. I know it's moving on. It says, a soul is perfect if its passable aspect is oriented toward, totally oriented towards God. In other words, um, that aspect of the soul which can change. In other words, <clears throat> our mind, our thoughts, our emotions, our memories. Um, if, we can, if we can orient ourselves completely towards God, um, we can we can approach perfection. So, but that's a that's a lot of work. So, shall we go on, or is there is there are there more questions? Yeah. 
it sounds like just keeping focused on your destination like when you're driving, not, not being distracted by, you know, tourist traps and stuff. Just, just keep your eyes ahead and your, your focus on your destination. Yeah. And really what it is, it's fo keeping focused on God. And, and keeping the, the awareness of God always present in our, in our mind and heart. Ninety-nine. Sure. A perfect intellect is one which, by true faith and in a manner beyond all unknowing, supremely knows the supremely unknowable. Wow. Wow. <laughs> let, let me do that. <laughs> Let, let me read that again. <clears throat> a perfect intellect <clears throat> is one which by true faith and in a manner beyond all unknowing, supremely knows the supremely unknowable. Mm -hmm. And which <clears throat> in surveying the entirety of God's creation has received from God an all-embracing knowledge of the providence and judgment which governs it in so far, of course, as all this is possible to man. So this again <laughs> describes the difference between knowing from the rational mind compared to knowing from uh, you know, divine divine knowledge, I guess. Okay, time has three divisions. <clears throat> Faith is co-extensive with all three. Hope with one, and I just lost the image. I'm back. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Okay, I think this is a math puzzle coming up. So time has three divisions. Faith is co-extensive with all three hope with one, and love with the remaining two. Moreover, faith and hope will last to a certain point, but love, united beyond union with him, who is more than infinite, will remain for all eternity, always increasing beyond all measure. That is why, quote, the greatest of them is love. Okay. Uh, let me unpack the three, these, these two verses. Okay. A perfect noose um, is one which by true faith, in other words, by the living experience of communion with God, which is what faith really is, and in a manner beyond all unknowing, in other words, it's, um, not, a, it's not about rational knowledge. Um, it's not about knowing about God. It's a matter of knowing God by ascending in, a, in, a, in an apophatic way um, through unknowing, through the negation of all of our concepts of God um, uh, to, uh, to the uh, uh, pure perception of God. Um, uh, which is the supreme knowledge of God, um, who is supremely unknowable. Does that make sense? Okay. God, this is, these are likely from Dionysius Theriopagite, I would bet. Mm. Either that or they're written very much in the style of Dionysius. <clears throat> And so, um, and which in surveying the entirety of God's creation, in other words, a perfect, a perfect noose, an, an intellect, um, surveying the entirety of God's creation has received from God an all embracing knowledge or, um, I hate to call it knowledge, but it's more like vision um, of the providence and judgment which governs the creation. In other words, the first state, the, 
the first major stage of, cont of contemplation is called natural contemplation, and it's contemplation of the creation. Um, but it's not simply admiring the flowers and the trees and the, you know, the forest and the bees and so forth. It's, um, it's being able to see God and to, and to perceive God's um, uh, presence in all created beings and thus the, the reason that all these beings exist. Okay. Um, and so perceiving that um, is this all embracing knowledge of the providence and judgment of God, um, which governs the creation. Um, to put it in different terms, it's the, it's the perception of the Logi of creation. Um, uh, and that last sentence is the real qualifier, insofar, as, of course, as this is possible to man. This is, this is, this is very, very profound. Um, contempl the depths, the real depths of contemplative awareness. Hmm. Number 100, time has three divisions. Um, uh, so past, present, and future, right? <clears throat> Faith is coextensive with all three. In other words, past, present, and future. Hope in the future. And love with the past and present, right? Moreover, faith and hope will last to a certain point. But love united beyond union with God, who is more than infinite, will remain for all eternity, always increasing beyond measure. That's why the greatest of, of them, in, them is love. So love and the love of God is, um, is not just it's not emotional love. It's, it's this ex living experience of, of God's um, uh, energy, his defining energy, which in itself is divine and thus and uncreated and thus la lasts to all eternity. Can I make a comment about 99? Uh -huh. uh, to simplify a part of the st statement, it, creationists use the analysis of uh, making a mouse trap. Uh, it's uh, composed of a few parts, but if you leave one part out, uh, nothing is uh, nothing works. Right. Uh, actually, uh, for instance, the Earth is at the right distance away from the sun. That, isn't that kind of a miracle uh, of uh, a creation right there? <clears throat> and uh, then there are many other examples of if you don't have this, you won't have anything. Uh, right. So uh, in this way, uh, the atheists, uh, I think, uh, should be defeated. They say that there is no God. Well, they see evidence all around us. Yep. Yeah, the atheists, you know, they, they're, you know, they're living in a two, in, they're living like in a two-dimensional reality. They can't, they can't perceive the, uh, that essential third dimension, the divine dimension. So they're, I like to call it the, I call them the flat Earth society. <laughs> <clears throat> That's good. So, Ladika, uh -huh. when it says the providence and judgment which govern it, um, it makes me think a little bit of David, where he says, like, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Uh -huh. So, 
he he being a man of great connection with God was able to see that the difficulties in his life were also part of God's providence. Uh-huh. Would that be part of what he's saying there in that 99? Yeah, I think so. Um, God's providence is, you know, permeates everything. Um, and and the entire the entire creation is, you know, operates through God's providence through His. You know, and it's um, heard of, somebody was made an interesting distinction between God's providence and God's will. God does not will uh, for people to suffer, but it's within His providence that they do because, and because it, the suffering becomes a means of of spiritual growth. So, but you know, and so. So all the all the things that happen in this world, you know, birth and death and um, illness and you know natural disasters and human disasters and it's all it's all within God's providence. It's not what He wants, but it's um, God is infinitely above the creation, and um, uh, it all becomes a a means of um uh, God working out his will for the salvation of the many whether we like it or not <laughs> sometimes we don't But but it, Christians are not fatalistic. At the same time, are no. are we? No. There's, there's a difference between you know a, a very fatalistic view of like I, I was just thinking. I don't know why I was thinking that this week, but you know, it, there's some of those strange verses about the end times that christ quotes and i was thinking of the one that says if you see that you know image of the desolation flee to the mountains or something right. so we understand that in god's providence all sorts of terrible things happen but there is a sense in which it's it's wise sometimes to <laughs> to hightail it out of there yeah yeah rather than just saying you know this is my lot so right exactly mm. exactly uh, Vladika, um i have a question about the term providence uh, is it somehow related to the greek word economia <laughs> yes i think so okay thank you um, I'm not sure what the Greek word is, but it may very well be. Pro- I think it is. I think it is economia. So, all right. Shall we get into the fourth century? It was a very good time. <laughs> Those were the days. Those were the days. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Alice, you want to keep reading? Okay. First, the, in, the intellect marvels when it reflects on the absolute infinity. Of- Can I plug in anything here? It's tricky. Hmm. So maybe I better move. So when looking, um, I'm just trying to follow where we are. This is Britt. I can't see you. I'm just listening. So where okay. are we in the text? I can't find in the table of contents. We're on, we're on the fourth century. 
of mm -hmm. uh, the 400 chapters on love. Number one. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> It probably is under St. Maximus, the Confessor, 400 chapters on love, and we're at number 300. Four. Thank you, dear. Number 300. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay so let me say, <clears throat> first, the intellect marvels when it reflects on the absolute infinity of God, that boundless sea for which it longs so much. Then it is amazed at how God has brought things into existence out of nothing. But just as, quote, his magnificence is without limit, end quote, so, quote, there is no penetrating his purposes. How can the intellect not marvel when it contemplates that immense and more than astonishing sea of goodness? Or how is it not astounded when it reflects on how and from what source there have come into being both nature endowed with intelligence and intellect and the four elements which compose physical bodies, although no matter existed before their generation? What kind of potentiality was it which once actualized, brought these things into being. But all this is not accepted by those who follow the pagan Greek philosophers, ignorant as they are of that all-powerful goodness and its effective wisdom and knowledge transcending the human intellect. So the first part of that I got lost in. Okay. Yeah. How can the intellect not marvel when it contemplates that immense and, whoops, and, and more than astonishing sea of goodness. In other words, when you first enter into, into contemplation, um, uh, it's an experience of the, um, of an immense spaciousness um, uh, and, but in, but not a, not a, not a, not an emptiness, but a, a full. But there's a fullness, um, and um, it's a sense of goodness. Um, and so, uh, and so, it, it, this is a, this is the, this is a, this is ref, what this these texts reflect is how. What when you when you what what you encounter when you enter into contemplative prayer? <clears throat> okay, so um, or how is it not astounded when it reflects on how and from <clears throat> what source there come into being both nature endowed with intelligence and intellect, and and what the elements which compose physical bodies? In other words, when you start turning your attention to thinking about or contemplate, not just thinking about in a rational way, but, but contemplating and seeing the, the divine um, reason underlying um, natural beings. Um, what was it that, that how, how is it that God brought these things into being? From nothing. Uh, what kind of potentially potentiality was it which once actualized brought these things into being? In other words, you know the the Greek pagan philosophers all uh, their idea was that God arranged matter, but He didn't create it. Um, of course, the the Christian idea is that God brought all things from non-existence into being. Um, uh, uh, from from uh, ex nihilo, and so that's uh, and so and so one is astonished at um, not not just at the beauty of the creation, but but how these things, how the creation itself uh, came into being. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and it's something beyond our human intellect. It's something beyond our understanding. Not only how God did it, um, but why God did it, uh, but what's most important is that God did it. So, does that make sense? When he talks about uh, not, not accepted by the pagan Greek philosophers, that's a different idea than the idea of, of uh, physical evolution, right? That, that, oh, yeah. yeah. No, the, the Greek philosophers, their, their idea was that God, um, uh, God did not create the world, uh, but that God only uh, was actually part of the creation, essentially. Um, and he simply arranged the matter of the world. Um, it's, there's no idea of ex nihilo, whereas um, uh, Judaism and Christianity, you know, have this fundamental idea uh, that God created the world out of nothing. Um, uh, and so, so the Greek philosopher's idea is a very, is very, um, uh, well, it's, it's something very rationalistic. Um, whereas, how does it make any sense that God created all things out of nothing? It doesn't. And, uh, Vladeka, yeah, uh, I uh, disagree with that statement because out of nothing implies that there was no energy. And energy uh, is God and it always was and always will be. And the laws of thermodynamics dynamics say it goes from a higher source to a lower source. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I, I disagree with that nothing part. Well, but that's the dogma of the church. Now, there's the uncreated divine energy, and the uncreated divine energy, activity of God, is what created the created beings and created energy. So that works uh, that works very well but god is the source of all things god is the source of all that energy so so number three uh -huh. god is the creator from all eternity and he creates when he wills in his infinite goodness, through his co-essential logos and spirit. Do not raise the objection, quote, why did he create a at a particular moment since he is good from all eternity, unquote. For I reply that the unsearchable wisdom of the infinite essence does not come within the compass of human knowledge. Mm -hmm. So don't ask. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Um, because uh, the reality is we simply can't understand it. I love God's answer to Job, Job 38 1. Um, where were you when I created the heavens and the earth? In other words, who do you think you are? <laughs> hey, Vladika. Yeah. I have a question, sorry, about the last one. That's okay. Um, the, so sometimes in the whole, like, uh, on the, maybe it's kind of a classical Greek sort of idea of, like, the um, way that this universe was set up. But so, there's this part that they call, like, you know, the prime mover. So in orthodoxy, you, you think that's too redundant to call God the prime mover? Well, God is the source of all things. So you could say he's a prime mover, um, but he's the source of all movement. So, um, you know, I mean, there are, of course there are analogies. Um, oh, I knew this is gonna happen. Uh -huh. No sooner do we get 
a telephone, a landline, <laughs> then what does it do? It rings. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, where are we? No, number four. Okay. When the creator willed, he gave being to and manifested that knowledge of created things which already existed in him from all eternity. For in the case of Almighty God, it is ridiculous to doubt that he can give being to anything when he so wills. Yeah. In other words, if God wills it, he can, he can, he can bring it into being. Try to learn why God created, for that is true knowledge. But do not try to learn how he created or why he did so comparatively recently. <laughs> For that does not come within the compass of your intellect. Of divine realities, some may be apprehended by men and others may not. Unbridled speculation, as one of the saints has said, can drive one headlong over the precipice. Amen. <laughs> Some say that the created order had coexisted with God from eternity, but this is impossible. For how can things which are limited in every way coexist from eternity with him who is altogether infinite? Or how are they really creations if they are co-eternal with the creator. This notion is drawn from the pagan Greek philosophers who claim that God is in no way the creator of being, but only of qualities. We, however, who know my God say that he is the creator, not only of qualities, but also of the being of created things. If this is so, created things have not coexisted with God from eternity. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the piece that reminds me of Ladika is you know, when I was an undergraduate in college, the Big Bang Theory was very much a, <laughs> a, a discussion, argument, and uh, you know, not, not accepted. And uh, the primary uh, contrary perception or theory was called the steady state universe. And in the steady state universe, that sounds very much like what I was talking about here, that uh, creation existed from eternity and, and will exist for eternity. Uh, so it, it, uh, it's fascinating to me that this issue was raised back in the, whenever it was, the fourth century, third century. Yeah. And, but it's, in, it's interesting if you, uh... You know, there's the expanding universe theory that it expands and collapses and expands and collapses. There's a big bang and then there's, uh, and then and it expands and it collapses and then there's another big bang. <laughs> and, right. and origin would have been totally on board with that. Hmm. That's, that was origin, how, that was how origin uh, understood it in the third century. Mm -hmm. Going back to number three, why did he create it at a given moment as versus evolution? Well, Darwin was a Christian and he believed in the, uh, the uh, teachings of the church as he understood it. But uh, there's no reason why uh, God could not have set it up so that things changed because uh, the skeletons of ancient man that we have, unfortunately not Adam's, uh, look very much different from the skeletons of people today. Yep. I think I think the advice that um, is there in number number five. Um, do not try to learn how he created or why he did so. We don't know. And comparatively recently, well, from God's time frame, four billion years is very recent. <laughs> you know. So I think we need to be, I need, we need to keep things in, in that perspective. 
we can't know how and why God created. So basically it's just saying that like marvel in the awe of what he did and try and basically grasp the truth that's available to us about the creation, but don't go beyond that. Right. We know that God created it. We don't know how he did it. And what can we do but stand in awe of it? You know, we can play with it, but all it does is it's just intellectual and kind of, it's just speculation. Number six, some say that the created order, I'm sorry, we, we did that, no, okay. Some say that the created order had coexisted with God from eternity, but this is impossible. For how can things which are limited in every way coexist from eternity with him who is altogether infinite? Or how are the really how are the really creations if they are co-eternal with the creator? This notion is drawn from the pagan Greek philosophers who claim that God is in no way the creator, being but only of qualities. I'm sorry, I've read it, read that. Yeah. So seven, <clears throat> divinity and divine realities are in some respects knowable and in some respects, unknowable. They are knowable in the contemplation of what appertains to God's essence and unknowable as regards that essence itself. That eventually uh, turns into uh, the ap what appertains to God's essence uh, later is um, defined as the uncreated energies. Mm. Eight, <clears throat> do not look for conditions and properties in the simple and infinite essence of the Holy Trinity. Otherwise, you will make it composite like created beings, a ridiculous and blasphemous thing to do in the case of God. Yeah, th this term, this word simple is, is something that we've run across, you know, often. And uh, it sounds like it's an important idea. It's very important. The simplicity of God. And the fact that it, you, it's not made up of Lego blocks. Right, exactly. No, there's no pieces, no parts. Number nine, only the infinite being, all powerful and creative of all things, coexisting as it does of being an accident, is composite and always in need of divine providence, for it is not free from change. Okay, I need to look at that one again. Yeah, I think I, I skipped a. Yeah, only the infinite being, all powerful and creative of all things, is simple, unique, unqualified, peaceful, and stable. Every creature consisting as it does of being an accident is composite and always in need of divine providence for it is not free from change. In other words, all created beings by, by nature are um, changing. Both intelligible, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Both intelligible and sensible nature, on being brought into existence by God, received powers to apprehend created beings. Intelligible nature received powers of intellection, and sensible nature powers of sense perception. Mm -hmm. Intelligible meaning noetic. God is only participating in. Creation both participates and communicates. It participates in being and in well being, but communicates only well being. But corporeal nature communicates this in one way and incorporeal nature in another. I, I didn't get that. <laughs> um, well, okay. Uh, 
creation both participates and communicates. Um, it participates in being, in other words, it exists, and in well-being, it can do, it can uh, exist in a, uh, you know, in a positive way, in other words, which ultimately is defined as uh, synergy with God. But it communicates only well-being. In other words, um, uh, through the creation, we can, um, uh, we, we, only God creates. And so um, uh, creation can convey well-being, but it can't create Creation does not bring about being. It procreates, but it does not create. Um, corporeal nature communicates this in one way, and incorporeal in another words. Corporeal, in other words, physical beings communicate this in one way, but angelic beings uh, in a different way. And then it explains it. Okay, 12. So incorporeal nature, the angels, uh -huh. communicates well-being by speaking, by acting, by being contemplated. Corporeal nature only by being contemplated. Mm -hmm. I guess, again, I, I don't get that. How, how, does, how does physical nature communicate by being contemplated? Well, you, um, when you, when you, uh, when when you uh, contemplate uh, created things, um, uh, you can you can you can come into an awareness of the divine presence and and the divine activity that that brought those things into being. I think I would interpret it that way. 13. Whether or not a nature endowed with intelligence and intellect is to exist eternally depends on the will of the creator, whose every creation is good. But whether such a nature is good or bad depends on its own will. Evil is not to be imputed to the essence of created beings, but to their erroneous and mindless motivation. A soul's motivation is rightly ordered when its desiring power is subordinated to self-control, where when its insensitive power rejects hatred and cleaves to love, and when its power of intelligence through prayer and spiritual contemplation, advances toward God. If in time of trial, a man does not patiently endure his afflictions, but cuts himself off from the love of his spiritual brethren, he does not yet possess perfect love or a deep knowledge of divine providence. The aim of divine providence is to unite by means of true faith and spiritual love, those separated in various ways by vice. Indeed, the Savior endured his sufferings so that, quote, he should gather together into one the scattered children of God, end quote. Thus, he who does not resolutely bear trouble, endure affliction, patiently sustain hardship, has strayed from the path of divine love and from the purpose of providence. If, quote, love is long-suffering and kind, a man who is faint-hearted in the face of his afflictions and who therefore behaves wickedly toward those who have offended him and stops loving them surely lapses from the purpose of divine providence. Watch yourself, lest the vice which separates you from your brother lies not in him but in yourself. Be reconciled with him without delay so that you do not lapse from the commandment of love. Do not hold the commandment of love in contempt, for through it you will become a son of God. But if you transgress it, you will become a son of Gehenna. 
What separates us from the love of friends is envying or being envied, causing or receiving harm, insulting or being insulted, and suspicious thoughts. Would that you had never done or experienced anything of this sort and in this way separated yourself from the love of a friend. Has a brother been the occasion of some trial for you and has your resentment led you to hatred? Do not let yourself be overcome by this hatred, but conquer it with love. You will succeed in this by praying to God sincerely for your brother and for accepting his apology or else by conciliating him with an apology yourself by regarding yourself as responsible for the trial and by patiently waiting until the cloud has passed. So that's easier said than done sometimes. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the, this is, this is what asceticism is all about. You know, this is, this is forcing yourself to forgive and, yeah and to not resent um, and to and to live in complete reconciliation um, with even those who have uh, hated and abused you it's hard 23 a long-suffering man is one who waits patiently for his trial to end and hopes that his perseverance will be rewarded The long, quote, the long suffering man abounds in understanding because he endures everything to the end and while awaiting that end patiently bears his distress. And as St. Paul says, is everlasting life. Quote, and this is life eternal that they may know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Do not lightly discard spiritual love. For men, there is no other road to salvation. Because today an assault of the devil has aroused some hate, <laughs> do not judge as base and wicked a brother, whom, a, a brother whom yesterday you regarded as spiritual and virtuous, but with long-suffering love dwell on the goodness you received yesterday and expel today's hatred from your soul. Do not condemn today as base and wicked the man whom yesterday you praised as good and commended as virtuous, changing from love to hatred because he has criticized you. But even though you are still full of resentment, commend him as before, and you will soon recover the same saving love. When talking with other brethren, do not adulterate your usual praise of a brother by surreptitiously introducing censure into the conversation because you still harbor some hidden resentment <clears throat> against him. On the contrary, in the company of others, give unmixed praise and pray for him sincerely as if you were praying for yourself then you will soon be delivered from this destructive hatred. So a quick question, maybe, maybe it, it's a, a distraction, but one of the things that we read often is that praise, personal praise of any kind is harmful because it leads to pride. And yet here, it, it seems like we're saying don't be afraid to praise your brethren. Is that right? Yeah, just not in their in their presence. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. So say good things about him to other people, but not to him. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't tell him you love him, that you care about him, that you're praying for him. But you don't have to tell him that he's the best thing since sliced bread. 29. Do not say, quote, I do not hate my brother when you simply efface the thought of him from your mind. Listen to Moses who said, quote, do not hate your brother in your mind, but reprove him and you will not incur sin 
through him. I'm not sure I got that. Me either. It's right up there. Oh. The um, part is the thing that's confusing to me. Well, I mean, in other words, don't say that you. I I don't hate my brother. Uh, when you, if you if you uh, try and um, remove him from your mind, if you, in other words, if you don't really even acknowledge his existence, you know, if you're if you're not. If you don't really care about him, in other words, um, do not hate your brother in your mind. In other words, don't allow resentment and anger to dwell in your mind. But um, uh, if, obviously, if necessary, reprove him. In other words, don't. In other words, don't completely overlook. Oh, thank you very much. Don't completely overlook his actions. Um, uh, in, that, in other words, don't ignore him, but if necessary, reprove him, and uh, you'll not be led into sin. In other words, if he does something which leads you into temptation, reprove him, and you won't be led into sin. Okay, but don't hate him in the. In the... Don't hate him. In other words, if he irritates you, say stop it. Um, uh, stop. You know, stop. Stop bugging me or whatever. Uh, rather than rather than um, just resenting him and saying, "Who's that idiot?" You know, and on and on and on. Okay, yeah, thirty. If if this stuff is very monastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it applies all sorts of places too. Yeah. Thirty. If a brother happens to be tempted and persists in insulting you. Do not be driven out of your state of love, even though the same evil demon tr troubles your mind. You will not be driven out of that state if, when abused, you bless. When slandered, you praise. And when tricked, you maintain your affection. This is the way of Christ's philosophy. If you do not follow it, you do not share his company. Mm -hmm. In other words, don't return. Don't return evil for evil, but return good for evil. <clears throat> Everyone, do not think that those who bring you reports which fill you with resentment and make you hate your brother are affectionately disposed towards you, even if they seem to speak the truth. On the contrary, turn away from them as if they were poisonous snakes that you <laughs> <laughs> Prevent them from uttering slanders and deliver your own soul from wickedness. Just mm -hmm. what it brings to my mind is is a uh, you know a judge. Never mind. <laughs> let's keep going. Well, let's put it. Let's put it into monastic context. <laughs> Don't think that those who bring you reports, in other words, who uh, who tattle on their brothers. Um, which fill you with resentment. Um, uh, and in other words, you know, say, you know, say they, they talk, they talk about the brother and, and, uh, and say that he's really, he really hates the abbot and he undermines the abbot and he's, you know, and, and so it creates a resentment in the abbot against that brother, right? Um, and don't, you know, don't, don't make the mistake of thinking that the people who, who do this and you know and try and and you know bring these reports to you are affectionately disposed or in other words are well disposed towards you um, even if they seem to speak the truth on the contrary turn the way from them so that you may both present prevent them from uttering slanders in other words that they come and slander the brother to you and deliver and and it delivers your own soul from wickedness in other words from the rancor and from and and from resentment. Okay, thirty-two. Do not irritate your brother by speaking to him equivocally. 
Otherwise, you may receive the same treatment from him. And so drive out both your love and his. Rather, rebuke him frankly and affectionately, thus removing the grounds for resentment and freeing both him and yourself from your irritation and stress. So that, that's a real skill, frankly and affectionately. Mm -hmm. Okay, 33, examine your conscience scrupulously in case it is your fault that your brother is still hostile. Do not cheat your conscience, for it knows your secrets, and at the hour of your death, it will accuse you. And in time of prayer, it will be a stumbling block to you. In times of peaceful relationships, do not recall what was said by a brother when there was bad feeling between you, even if offensive things were said to your face or to another person about you and you subsequently heard of them. Otherwise, you will harbor thoughts of rancor and revert to your destructive hatred of your brother. The day-formed soul cannot nurse hatred against a man and yet be at peace with God, the giver of the commandments. For he says, quote, if you do not forgive men their faults, neither will your heavenly father forgive you your faults. If your brother does not wish to leave peaceably with you, nevertheless, guard yourself against hatred, praying for him sincerely and not abusing him to anybody. The perfect peace of the holy angels lies in their love for God and their love for one another. This is also the case with all the saints. From the beginning of time, most truly, therefore, it is said that, quote, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And Stop pleasing yourself and you will not hate your brother. Stop loving yourself, and you will love God. So that that deserves a, a thought, I think. I mean, oh. Well, it's you know, all the root of all sin is self love. Um, so stop pleasing yourself. In other words, stop gratifying yourself. Um, and you will not hate your brother because our hate, our hatred of our neighbor uh, usually comes from uh, anger and irritation and envy and um, and you know all these other kinds of all these other kinds of passions um, and uh, some of that is very self gratifying um, because it all comes out of pride and conceit and arrogance and um, and uh, uh, vainglory. Um, so if we stop stop loving ourself, in other words, it, if we can get our focus off of ourself, in other words, if we can stop being self-centered, um, uh, but rather focus on God and and make Him the the uh, focal point of our life, uh, then then truly we'll love our brethren. And that's why that's not contradictory to, uh, quote, love your neighbor as yourself. No, it's not, not contradictory at all. Loving our neighbor as ourself means to love our neighbor who is ourself. Yeah. Our neighbor is our truth. Is, in other words, we have to put our neighbor on the, on the same level as, um, as ourself. And not see a, you know, not, and, you know, and so never let any, any kind of hatred or anything, and especially the, you know, the envy and jealousy and, and all of that kind of, or judgment or so forth, um, intrude. Thirty-eight. Once you have decided to share your life with spiritual brethren, Renounce your own wishes from the start. Unless you do this, you will not be able to live peaceably either with God or with your brethren. He who has attained perfect love and has ordered his whole life in accordance with it 
is the person who says, quote, Lord Jesus in the Holy Spirit. I'm not sure I understand that. Well, if we have attained perfect love, that means that we're, um, we've become completely vessels of the love of God um, and, and have ordered our life in accordance with it. In other words, <clears throat> we've cast out all sin and overcome all of our self-centeredness. Um, uh, then, on, then truly we're able to, um, uh, to say in the, in the Holy Spirit, we're, in other words, we're able to truly be in the Spirit and, and be able to recognize Jesus as the Lord. We have that, we'd have then only, it, in, or, in other words, perfect love is the criterion to be able to have true faith. Love, love for God always aspires to give wings to the intellect in its communion with God. Love for one's neighbor makes one always think good thoughts about him. The man who still loves empty fame or is attached to some material object is naturally vexed with people on account of transitory things or harbors rancor or hatred against them or is a slave to shameful thoughts. Such things are quite foreign to the soul that loves God. If you have no thought of any shameful word or action in your mind, harbor no rancor against someone who has injured or slandered you, and while praying, always keep your intellect free from matter and form, you may be sure that you have attained the full measure of dispassion and perfect love. It is no small struggle to be freed from self-esteem. Such freedom is to be attained by the inner practice of the virtues and by more frequent, frequent prayer. And the sign that you've attained it is that you no longer harbor rancor against anyone who abuses or has abused you. If you want to be a just person, assigned to each aspect of yourself, to your soul and your body, what accords with it, to the intelligent aspect of the soul, assigned spiritual reading, contemplation, and prayer, to the insensitive aspect, spiritual love, the opposite of hatred, to the desiring aspect, moderation and self-control, to the fleshy part, food for clothing, for these alone are necessary. The, the intellect functions in accordance with nature when it keeps the passions under control, contemplates the inner essence of created beings, and abides with God. As health and disease are to the, whole, to the body of a living thing, and light and darkness to the eye, so virtue and vice are to the soul, and knowledge and ignorance to the intellect. The commandments, the doctrines, the faith, these are the three objects of the Christian's philosophy. The commandments separate the intellect from the passions. The doctrines lead it to the spiritual knowledge of created things and faith to the contemplation of the Holy Trinity. Some of those pursuing the spiritual way only repel impassioned thoughts. Others cut off the passions themselves. Such thoughts are repelled by psalmody or by prayer or by raising one's mind to God or by occupying one's attention in some similar way. The passions are cut off through appropriate detachment from these things by which they arouse, those things by which they are aroused. The passions are aroused in us, for example, women, wealth, fame, and so on. We can achieve detachment with regard to women when, after withdrawing from the world, we wither the body as we should through self-control. We can achieve detachment where wealth is concerned when we make up our mind to be frugal in all things. We can become indifferent to fame by practicing the virtues inwardly 
in a way visible only to God. And we can act in a similar fashion with respect to other things. A person who has achieved such detachment as this will never hate anybody. Is this clear? Yes, I think so. Okay. So let's, uh, we'll make number 50 the last one for tonight. Okay. He has who renounced such things in marriage, possessions, and other worldly pursuits is outwardly a monk, but may not yet be a monk inwardly. Only he who, who has renounced the impassioned conceptual images of these things has made a monk of the inner self, the intellect. It is easy to be a monk in one's outer self if, if one wants to be, but no small struggle is required to be a monk in one's inner self. Okay. Hmm. This is really important. In other words, it's really easy, it's easy to get all dressed up and uh, be, a, be a monk outwardly. But being a monk in, inwardly is, is really not about all of those external forms. It's, it's, it's about this inner detachment. Um, Okay, so, all right, well, so uh, to, uh, tomorrow night, I assume it, um, well, at St. Herman's, we have the great canon of St. Andrew. Um, I don't know about St. John's. Yeah, we do. Yeah, so um, something well worth, uh, well worth attending, so. And um, uh, so my hope is that uh, when we meet next week, we'll finish off these last 50 um, chapters. In, uh, and then, then we need to think about what, what we need to, what we want to do. If we want to keep it, if we want to keep going to St. Maximus, we can do that. Um, his mystagogy is really interesting. Mm. <clears throat> the, the divine liturgy. So, something to think about. Thank you, Vladeka. More Saint Maximus. What's that? More Saint Maximus. Well, I think I like. Yeah. I, I'm enjoying Saint Maximus a lot. Yes, I am too. So. This pedagogy would be great. Okay. Yep. Good. So, but we'll we'll so we'll finish this off um, next week, and then we'll uh, take a week off for uh, uh, Holy Week and Pascha. Um, uh, is there is there a time you'd like to come, um, and we can we can get together for a Paschal celebration? Mm -hmm. Ah, uh, yes. During 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 the week, during bright week, or um, what do you think? Do you want to you want to try for uh, like Thomas Sunday afternoon after liturgy, or evening rather for dinner? How does that sound? <clears throat> Or you could um, uh, come down for possible liturgy, but uh, it's kind of hard. Yeah. Since since you all have obligations. So anyway, we'll make we'll make plans next week for that. Good. <clears throat> Very good. Okay. That would be great. Okay. That sounds great to me. Very good. All right. Well, God bless you. Let's pray. It is truly me to bless the Atheotokos, ever blessed and most blameless in the mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim. 
Without corruption, thou gavest birth to God the Word. Truth, Theotokos, we magnify thee. The blessing of the Lord be upon you through his grace and love for mankind, always now and ever into ages of ages. Amen. 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 Thank you, Vladika. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.